Guys, I'm going to tell you, you can't be into everything in this industry. You need to find your niche and stick with it. And today I have Dave Griffith with me to talk about that. When we talk about narrowing and when we talk about kind of figuring out what a niche is, the less and less that I do and try to do and try to sell and talk to people about, the more and more successful that I have become on the on the selling side, on the interacting with customer side, on the finding paying paying clients and, and job side. And I think that that is that is one of the hardest lessons that I think there is to learn in this business is I don't know, maybe less is more, right? So I, I would say le- less is more. And I see a lot of people who program, you know, PLCs that want to do HMI development, that want to do SCADA development, that want to do MES, and and then they want to do networking, kind of all of these things. And pretty soon you could build a whole factory, but then your selling process is what? I'm going to build a whole factory, and now you're competing against multi-billion dollar construction firms? So if you pick one thing and you're very good at it, and you use that as an entry point in order to start conversations and find jobs and find work, then you become known as the PLC person, or you become known as the MES person. And by doing that, people are going to come find and seek you out. And so a lot of what I've done in the last six or seven years of my career, many of the videos and other things, and I think the reason Tim and I originally met is because you know it's a lot of education focus. And I find that if you can give people knowledge within what you're doing, then you become seen and known as the expert. And if you are seen and known as the expert, then people are going to come and search you out. So I I had a, I had a really funny phone call a a number of years ago, Tim. Uh, I was, I I was in a hotel, I think Uh, I was getting some work done before I, I was heading out. And I had a person call me, like I didn't have their phone number saved. I had a person call me. And I said, hello, this is Dave, because that, that's how I answer the phone. And they asked me, like, fr- from dead nothing, they asked me if I'm currently drinking a cup of coffee. Now, anyone who has seen my videos probably knows that, that I am never too far away from a cup of coffee. But, Tim, we had a five-minute cup of coffee. Ironically, I just thrown the last cup out and was getting ready to go get another cup. Four or five minutes turned into, I'm sorry, who is this? Like, I don't have you saved in my phone. But we had a nice cup of conversation about coffee, and it, and it turned into a, a project opportunity because the people had seen me, uh, again, kind of from my videos and, and from the education side, and it goes back to the do what you do very well and kind of niche down into that. And if you are seen as an expert in that, then people are going to call and search you out because in this industry, it's not that there are, well, there are more now than a few years ago, but there are not a ton of people making videos and educational content. Like there are a lot of people making sales content. There are not a lot of people telling you this is how a PLC works, or this is the math that we put together to go in OEE, and this is why we do it, and this is where we pull the variables from. And if you can be seen as the educator in the space, then you're going to find more opportunities, which is kind of a medium to long-term play and is really hard for many people to wrap their, their minds around. But based solely upon the fact that Tim and I are sitting here having this conversation, I think you both can, I think everyone can understand that Tim and I both agree on that. And even today, it's very difficult for me to say, yeah, start off in a very narrow niche. Is you know, when you're starting out, when you're trying to build your identity, and honestly, I didn't even think I, I, if you told me, what, 16 years ago, I guess now, that this, I would be sitting here doing this exact thing, I'd be like, nah, not for me. But I do have an early story that really started me understanding this is I do believe you do need to be well-rounded. Narrowed in your niche doesn't mean that you don't know other stuff. Like, you know, I come from a mechanical background. I could put together machines and work on hydraulics and stuff like that long before I knew how to wire a motor starter. But I was on a furnace system one day and they're like, yeah, the blower drive keeps faulting out. And I go in there, you know, and I'm checking. I'm like, all right, the motor, the motor's pulling too many amps. And so I kind of get in there and I'm looking and I'm like, hey, these bearings are bad in this blower shaft. And instead of leaving it right there and being like, call me after you change the bearings, like, do you want me to change those bearings for you? And I mean, it's like, why did I say this? But you know what? I need, you know, I needed money. I needed jobs. And 
They're like, yeah, that's great, because we sure don't have time to do it. So I go over to the industrial supply place, and there were the guys there, and I'm like, yeah, I need two such and such bearings. Now, Dave, we were talking about bearings. You know, th this is probably probably a three and a half inch shaft. You know, we're not talking about some small bearings. You know, so now I got to go grab some cumber logs so I can lift this shaft up. You know, and I, I mean, I, you know, so now I'm I'm five hundred dollars in tools into this, and it's one o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden it occurs to me, I'm like. Why am I changing bearings out in this blower? I'm the controls guy. I should have told them, your motor is fine. Get somebody to change the bearings. But that was the first time all of a sudden it's like, you know, I can't, I can't do everything. I cannot do a good job of changing those bearings out. I did get them changed. The motor did run after that. Any decent mechanical guy who has tools on his truck could have changed that out in about three hours compared to my eight or nine hours it took. Yeah, and five, $500 in tools. I, I have learned, like the, the hard lesson that has brought me to the niche is just because I can doesn't mean I should. And, and so just because you can't, like because you possess the, I guess, theoretical physical ability to do it doesn't mean you should do it because as soon as you start doing it, then then Tim becomes, yeah, Tim, uh, like, I think he maybe works on some PLCs, but he, you know what he did really well? He changed the bearings in this blower motor. Tim is the guy I'm calling to change the bearings the next time this blower motor goes out. I tell people that my most valuable tool that, that I carry around with me is, is this thing. It's my phone, because in it, I possess thousands of phone numbers and emails and other contacts. And, and the, the one of the main values that I bring is that I know the experts in everything, right? Like I know the people that are very good and focus on this particular thing. And when I run into this particular problem, they are the people that I call. And when I run into other problems, I have other people that I know who focus on that because they are the experts in their field. And I can't be the expert in everything. As soon as you try to be the expert in everything, you're, you're probably, well, in this industry, you're far below average in everything. Kind of going back to my original question, though, is if you are starting out in this industry, can you really not be broad <laughs> no, no. when you're trying to get customers? I, I just saw a post on LinkedIn by a guy the other day, and he's doing a really good job of start, you know, growing his company. But really, that post read, we can do anything. And I almost, I almost put a comment in there. No, you can't. So I think that as you are young as a person starting out in industry, or as you're young as a company starting out in industry, unless if you're a company, unless you are a known expert in something, you're probably not saying no to jobs. And I'm certainly not saying that you should say no to jobs. You should say yes, because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is money for rent money for food, the wife and the kids and everyone happy. And that is the most important function. That is why we work, right? The, the, we work to make money to do the other things. And so as you're young, you have to go do things. I think it is the age and experience that allows Tim and I to go laugh about the bearing story because we've both been like me, not personally bearings, but like I've been there at one o'clock in the morning uh, with, with this realization of, like, why did I do this thing? Like, why didn't I have like 20 seconds more of forethought in order to realize that I, I was a mistake, right? I, I would almost say that, that Tim could have called someone, subbed that job out and made more money and known $500 less useless tools to this day than he could have being there at, you know, three, four, five o'clock in the morning trying to trying to do the bearing. So I think it is it is a function of, experience to know just because you can doesn't mean you should. And mo I think that the market in general is in a place that it needs a lot of automation skills, right? So if you're there saying you can do it, you might be the only person in your area that has availability to do this thing. So it makes a lot easy yeses. But at some point, the market is going to cool off. There isn't going to be as much automation demand, or there'll be more people starting companies moving into your area. And then you want to be known for something. People that are no people that are known for something, like let's say you're developing SCADA, right? L like let's say you're developing SCADA or something. You can put theoretical numbers on it, charge two hundred dollars an hour to develop SCADA. But 
you can't charge $200 an hour to develop PLCs in, in most places, right? Typically, that, that market is going to be a little bit lower. So what I have found is that people start with PLCs and they're charging X number of dollars. And then as they go up kind of that automation vertical, they can't get above charging that, that number of dollars, which is why I know people doing robots at 125 or 130 bucks an hour is because they're seen as the people that I call for my PLCs or they're the people that I call for my DCS issues. This is their rate. This is what I pay them. They can do these things up there and I'm going to call them because they're half the cost of other groups that I work with. I think those two stories were awesome. They were perfect balancing stories. It's about as concise as you and I are probably going to get on this, Tim. <laughs> yep, you're right. We've had some great conversations. But, you know, honestly, I'm not even sure I know what you do for a living. Let's talk about that. So look, click here, and let's go figure out what Dave does for a living. <laughs>